Lecture number eight. Now, if you'll all open your copies of the Book of Mormon. Question? Yeah. The Gospel of Work? Yeah, the Gospel of Work. Yeah, the Tenth Commandment, you see, says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods, nor thy neighbor's house, nor thy neighbor's flocks. We are to get out and earn our own. You see, that's the Gospel of Work. There are some people that sit down and uh, they have a gospel of dependency. How do you figure out how to get it easy without working? You say, he's got it. Now, how can I, how can I get his? Let me see. He's he really got a nice thing going there. Now, let me see. Uh, how can I kind of con him into giving me some of that? Well, that is the reason why we emphasize the gospel of work or industry. Um, we believe in cultivating our own fields, educating ourselves, being able to make a contribution, becoming indispensable. Now, if all of you will get out your Book of Mormon, Johnny. Yes, isn't that interesting that on, in 2 Nephi 2 and 15, it says that the tree, the forbidden fruit was sweet and the tree of life was bitter. That's interesting. That's the only passage that refers to it that way. But then, when Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, what did she say? It is delicious. But uh, this uh, tree of life fruit, that was medicine. But nevertheless, it would have suspended the seeds of death in Adam and Eve. They actually would have lived forever. Apparently never had any children. Uh, lived in a state of, um, uh, of fallen paradisiacal horror forever and ever and the Lord said that would have completely frustrated the whole program so I was I just wanted you to know that it was possible for me to have given you immortality in the Garden of Eden but for me to exalt you I have to have your spirit out of your body so you must die that's one of the greatest blessings I can give you once you've fallen because I use your spirit to exalt your body and this is on the examination by the way are you listening our Heavenly Father says, I have to have you die because I use your spirit to exalt your flesh and bring it up to that high level. Don't, don't lose that doctrine. It's one of the most precious doctrines we have. The only way, the only, shall we, let me say, the only um, time that God has revealed anywhere in the scripture why we have to die is in modern scripture. And uh, so that's uh, it's a little doctrine there that's tucked away. Our Heavenly Father says, it's so important that you die. So the bitter fruit, tree of life, turned out to be bitter. What's the reference on that? Uh, 88, uh, and I want to say uh, 29, but let me, or 28, but let me be sure. Listen to this verse. And they who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same which is their natural body, ye shall receive your bodies and your glory meaning that of your spirit will be the glory by which your bodies are quickened that's a beautiful passage and if you lose it you'll have a difficult time finding it doctrine covenants 88 and 28 and your glory is the glory by which your body is quickened as the prophet joseph smith said and i'm paraphrasing a cigarette wouldn't keep you out of the celestial kingdom but disobedience would that interesting and when you are immoral your body doesn't know the difference between sexual relations in or out of marriage your body can't tell the difference it scars your spirit not your body unless you've got a venereal disease or something so righteousness is constantly making its impact on your spirit and it's the glory of your spirit by which your bodies are resurrected and therefore the 88 section says if I pull your spirit out and it is worthy of celestial exaltation, then you'll get a celestial body. The next verse says, but if that spirit is terrestrial, that's the highest degree of glory I can elevate your body to. And if your spirit is only telestial, that's as high as I can bring your body up. And not worlds without ends will that body be able to go into the presence of the Father. It'll be destroyed. So it's a completely different makeup than a celestial body. These are, these are great concepts. Uh, see how Heavenly Father every once in a while he pulls back the veil and he says, you want to know what it's like up here in the eternities? You can take a little peek. I'll just give you a little, little peek. 
but I had to have you die. It would have been terrible if you hadn't died because the spirit was trapped in the body and I could do nothing for you. There's a science in the heavens as well as on the earth. I had to have you die. That was so important once you'd fallen. All right, any, uh, anything further on that? Yes. Um, no, that's a different tree of life. Um, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden was actually one that represents the suspending of the seeds of death in the body. The tree of life in the vision of Lehi is the love of God that gave us the atonement and the Savior. So you've got two different symbols here. They're, they're quite different. So I appreciate your mentioning that. We mustn't confuse them. One is the tree of physical life, which was in the Garden of Eden, and one is the tree of spiritual and eternal life, which was in the dream of Lehi. Maybe that's the way to say it so that we'll differentiate. The tree of physical life in the Garden of Eden, the tree of spiritual life in the vision of Lehi. Uh, I was a little bit confused with, uh, I wondered a little bit about that. Um, let me say, put it this way. We had one generation, which was my generation, where we lost a lot of the deep doctrine of the church. We're just digging it up again. And you'll find even some of the authorities saying, uh, after that interlude, when we kind of lost touch with the early brethren, uh, that obviously sons of perdition would be resurrected because it says Cain will rule over Satan. And based on that, they assumed that they never would lose their bodies. And it's true that during a brief interval after the resurrection, um, Cain with a body will rule over Lucifer. But the early brethren said then there will come a time when they'll both lose their bodies. Satan will lose his spirit body and Cain will lose his resurrected body. The elements that are in them will go back to the um, resurrected planets to which they belong and those stripped naked intelligences having lost their personality and identity go out back into outer darkness into the chaos of unorganized intelligence. And our father says, that's a hell I cannot describe the terrors of it. That's the 76th section. Now that's the teachings of the early brethren. Now some of our modern brethren took the other view, and when I asked them why, they said, well, it was based on that statement of the prophet. Now when I pointed out some of these other things that we'd been running across, they were as delighted as, uh, as we were to find it, because it gave deeper insight. Look at... Uh, let me show you something here that the Savior says over in section 88 to, to let you see why that doctrine would be a correct one. Section 88, verse 50. Uh, 35 and 50 are related. Listen to verse 35. That which breaketh the law and abideth not by law but seeketh to become a law unto itself, and willeth to abide in sin, and altogether abideth in sin, cannot be sanctified by law, neither by mercy, which means the atonement, nor justice, nor judgment. Therefore they must remain filthy still. And then Jesus says in verse 50, Then shall ye know that ye have seen me, and that I am, that I am the true light that is in you, and you are in me. Otherwise ye cannot abound. You can't exist forever as a resurrected being if one is in violation of all the laws that hold the universe together. Now you'll notice that in Alma it's going to tell us that once a body is resurrected it never can be divided again in death. Then how does the second death take effect? Well that body is never divided again into spirit and temporal matter. That's impossible. Never can be divided into spirit and temporal matter. What it can do is to disintegrate as resurrected matter and go into a resurrected earth. That's what the early brethren taught. Hope I haven't lost any of you on that one. But um, the, uh, there's been quite a bit of, uh, what shall I say, discussion on the ultimate destiny of the sons of perdition, and that's the best I've been able to find. It all fits the scripture. Yes? Where did you find the interpretation that... Um what I've just told you? Uh -huh. It's... Um, it's all through the Journal of Discourses, and I put it together into a, in a little handout called um, a working memorandum on the second death that you can pick up in my office anytime you might wish, with all the references. Yes. When it says lose, lose light, it means that the intelligences of the universe withdraw from it. They just back off. 
Have you noticed how you react to somebody that has done something terribly wrong? You've, they've been a, you've been associated with them, and all of a sudden you find out the, the, their, their whole life and order is corrupt and contrary to what you believe in. You notice how you find yourself backing off? That's removing light from that person. And um, light, the Lord says um, that intelligence is light or truth and that light and that uh, truth is constantly broadcasting these little intelligences constantly broadcast uh, they radiate what they are doing what they're thinking and the Lord constantly radiates to them now if they if 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 there's anyone in the universe that offends those little intelligences withdraw and you immediately feel the impact of it and darkness enters in the early brethren thought so, and in the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, I think it's about section 18, I'd have to look it up, the Lord says don't ever preach that they get a second chance. Oh, those intelligences, they're not penalized at all. Oh, yes, they just go back in part of a resurrected earth and enjoy the glory and uh, fun of going right on. I mean, no, no need to handicap all those intelligences that were in Cain's body that made up his body just because he... Uh, the superintelligence Cain went wrong, right? You follow that? Yeah, but it's just Cain. It's just Cain's individual personality intelligence that's cast back into outer darkness. And he goes back not as a personality. As Brigham Young says, he loses his identity as, a, as an individual and goes back as just an intelligence. He is not a person anymore. He's become an unperson. You ever hear that before? Yes, could he be picked up to do it again? I think I know why he doesn't get a second chance. Because if you achieved a status of godhood, and our Heavenly Father said, now go out, there's matter out there, and bring it in and organize the element and the intelligence together. The intelligence to act, the element to be acted upon. Do you notice that in the scriptures? Those are the two building blocks of the universe. So you go scooping up all these unorganized intelligences to start building your little worlds and, and galaxies and so forth and all of a sudden as they come through the little testing you run across a, a little personality who turns out to be Lucifer I yes Lucifer I know you I've learned my lesson give me another chance I'll obey you I'll honor you I'll sustain you I'll never betray again you going to take a chance? You want to take a chance with him? I would say, Lucifer, you were far more intelligent than I, and you betrayed Father. I'd never take a chance on you. I'm sorry. In any event, the Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants, don't ever teach that they get another chance. So we don't. And I think that's the rationale behind it. It's not that it, was, it wouldn't be possible for them to have another chance. You can see why it wouldn't be probable. At least I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't dare take a chance with them. These, these sons of perdition were brilliant stars of the morning who fell. Yes. Uh, where the Lord said, uh, don't teach that doctrine. I have it in my little handout. I can't remember the exact verse, but it's in the little handout. Working memorandum on the second death. Gives you all the footnotes and all the references. All right, now will you do something for me? Will you turn to page, um, or, or rather to 1 Nephi, um, chapter 20. Quite a number of you called or came and said, Brother Skousen, this Isaiah is for the birds. I just can't stay with Isaiah. And that's why we've got Nephi's commentary. Now, he put this in, we think, for a very definite purpose. When he got over to America, you'll notice that they arrived in America and he started explaining to his brethren about things and he wants to talk about the last days. Nephi is obsessed with the last days. Who else was obsessed with the last days? Isaiah. And as he got to reading the brass plates, Nephi said, Oh, the things I wasn't allowed to record, Isaiah was able to record. Oh, that's nice. I'll just put Isaiah in the record and then comment on him. 
Now, what did the spirit, what did the angel say to Nephi about recording what he saw? Thou shalt not do it. Now you watch him. He's going to start interpreting Isaiah for you. And then all of a sudden he'll say, now I durst not say any more at this time. He's not quite sure whether it's proper or not. Four times he's going to refer to the fact that he's trying to tell us something and uh, he's on the verge of doing it and twice the Spirit deliberately stops him. On two occasions, one he says, I'm forbidden. The next time he says, I, I durst not tell you any more at this time, meaning he wanted to tell you more. And then twice the Spirit will say, that's all Nephi. Don't tell them how it comes out. Now that's really what's happening here. And you're reading Isaiah, deliberately put into this record by Nephi, who had seen the same thing. And when his brethren say, we don't understand that, Nephi says, goody, I'll tell you what, I saw it and I'll tell it so you cannot err. And he starts to tell it. And the Lord will let him tell everything up to about 1974, right up around here. And that's about as far as he lets him go. He doesn't tell him these next 30 years. And Nephi knew how it came out. Now, it's a good thing the Lord actually didn't let it be told because we're too weak. If he said no matter what, it was going to turn out okay and we'd save the United States, etc., you know what we'd do. We'd... We'd lie back on the oars, we wouldn't have nearly as many missionaries, we wouldn't be storing our food, and we, a lot of people would get trapped. On the other hand, if the Lord said, well, it's unfortunately, there's going to be a real trauma, there'll be a real tragedy, and the nation will go down even though the saints survive, a lot of people would go up into the mountains with their two years supply to set it out. You know what would happen. In either case, the Lord says, now I'll tell you which way it can go. And it's going to go way one, or the, one way or the other, depending on what's put into the computer. Now work, work, because you can save this country. It's possible. If you keep it from going antichrist, it will survive and help us build a new Jerusalem. And we'll hit that in the 21st chapter of 3rd Nephi. That's a promise of the Lord that we can save this nation if it doesn't go antichrist. And we're struggling to save it. Uh, but the adversary is struggling too, you notice. And um, all right, now, I want to, want to show you something that's kind of interesting. Will you read with me the first verse? And I want you to pick out one, two, three, four, five phrases that tell you everything important in that verse so that you could stand up here and start talking about that chapter and just glance at those single words, if possible, single words, and have them tell you the rest of it. Hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, which means soldier of God, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, or out of the waters of baptism, who swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. All right, you're going to be stand up here giving a talk. What do you want to put circles around? Now, don't just underline it. It won't jump out at you. You've got to actually draw a little circle around. If you've got a pencil, do it just experimentally. What would be the first uh, word that you would want to have your mind remember? Israel. Okay, we'll circle Israel. This is a message to Israel, who has come forth out of the waters of Judah. Now, there you'd probably want to circle all three words, waters of Judah which means baptism. Now, that's not in Isaiah, and it's not in the first edition of the Book of Mormon. It's the only substantial edition to the entire Book of Mormon put in by Joseph Smith in the second edition. He said to the brethren, the waters of Judah always meant waters of baptism in ancient times. Barley P. Pratt said, but Brother Joseph, nobody will understand that today. Well, the prophet said, the Lord told me that, that that meant waters of baptism. Well, he said, why don't you put it in? And uh, so, in the next edition, he put it in, as I recall, in parentheses, so that you'd know that it meant that. Now, it should actually be in italics, but it is the right of a translator to say whatever is necessary to make the wording clear. And as Brother Nibley says, he really was legitimately uh, entitled to put it in, but it should have been in italics to remind you that that's his explanation, as it is in the Bible. You notice some words are in italics? little different print than the regular print. That's to tell you the interpreters put that in so that you'd get the full meaning of the phrase, that that word isn't really in the original. So I would circle baptism, waters of Judah and baptism. 
um, chapter uh, 20 of 1 Nephi, which is a quotation of Isaiah 48. Okay? So I'd put baptism. And then they swear by the name of the Lord, which is the most holy uh, oath that you can make. And uh, so I would uh, circle swear. And then they don't do it in truth. So I would put not truth and righteousness, or not in, maybe not in truth is enough. Now, after you've circled that, I just want you to notice what you can do. You look down at your page, and it says, Israel, waters of Judah, baptism, swear, not truth, righteousness. That's what you've got circled, okay? Now, that's everything important in that verse. And you can hit those, verse, those words. You see, that's only probably 10% of the words. Maybe it's more than that. 15% of the words that are in the verse. And you know everything that that verse was trying to tell you. Israel, you came out of the waters of Judah, which means baptism, swearing in the name of God that you would serve him, and it's been a lie. You haven't lived up to your covenants. Isn't that what he's saying? Any problem in understanding Isaiah? Okay. Uh, then he says, um, uh, you call yourselves of, of the holy city, meaning Jerusalem, but you don't stay yourselves upon the God of Israel, who is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is his name. So, um, I would circle holy city and not stay. You try to make it a single word if you can, but there occasionally it's, you have to put two together to make it make sense. So that reminds me, yes, you people, you're from the great city of Salt Lake, the headquarters of the Mormon church, yes, yes, but your lives are profligate, you're like whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. That's what he'd be saying. In this case, it's Jerusalem, the holy city. And then he says, Behold, I have declared former things from the beginning, so I, I circled former and beginning. You might want to say former things, but that's, that was enough to remind me. I've told you about everything before it was going to happen. And then I, under, and then I circled suddenly. So here's what the Lord is saying. I gave you advice way in advance of what was going to happen. And I did it suddenly and unexpectedly so that you couldn't see it coming up to the point where it would be accomplished. Now, I, I wrote um, a book called Prophecy in Modern Times in which I just said what the Lord would say about the Jews being allowed to return to Israel. And many of my friends who are scholars said, Brother Skousen, you really put your neck out because the Arabs just aren't going to allow that. I said, I didn't put my neck out. All I did was say what the Lord said. I'm just a reporter. I wasn't doing any speculating. He says they're going to be there with their own country and their own judges and their own governors. He says they're going to be there. I said this in 1939 in Prophecy in Modern Times. And it was interesting to watch the intellectuals in the church saying, Brother Scotson is so, uh, I mean, he's way out. He's, yeah. With the Lord, you see, way out. I, that's what I said to one of them. I said, you're never way out when you're with the Lord. He said it, it will come to pass. So when it came to pass, I thought I ought to write a book and point it out. So we called it Fantastic Victory. And there they were. Now the Lord says, now I told you. And I told you these things before it was even reasonable to think they would come to pass. And um, then in the fourth verse he says, but you were obstinate. You got necks like an iron sinew. You got a brow like brass. Uh, you're like Danes when it comes to pounding anything into your head. This is a favorite expression of my father. He says, we Danes, he said, and I said, what was his expression? We, we seem dense, but our brains are like steel traps once we get it. <laughs> and, and I found that to be true. There are certain mentalities you think they are dull. They're not. They, are, they just take a long time to impress, but once it's in the computer, they associate very fast. They can, they can handle the material very fast, but their absorption is slow. Doesn't mean they're dull-witted. Just means they're that they're that kind of a personality. If you happen to be that kind, don't get discouraged. You got some of these brilliant, scintillating people. Well, they got the radar antennas out all the time. They're picking up things. They articulate, they, so forth, and they seem so brilliant. They they can remember everything so well, and yet when time is gone, these people turn out not to be able. They're ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. They have no sense of logic, or of equating things together. They can't creatively project. 
the scintillating mind is often very deceptive, even to the person who has it. Yet it has no depth. And then some of the solid brains, that you, you have to take a hammer to beat into them to, to get, get an impression through. Why, they'll, um, they, they're able to respond. But it's a different thing when you have a brow of brass that resists the truth. It's not a question of trying to get an impression and having it difficult. It's not wanting to try. Brow of brass. This is a great writer, isn't he? This whole book was written in poetry by Isaiah. Brilliant. As he's going to say here in just a moment, I came to you as a polished shaft in the quiver of the Lord. Don't you tell the people I was a rustic. I came to you with brilliant language, all of it given to me as a gift of God. And don't say that you didn't understand or that, you, that I was so rustic and primitive that you didn't think I was a servant of God. I came to you with the finest education of our civilization. Oh, he really roasts them. And he wasn't roasting either. I just said, God, give me these talents. And I'm using them to lay it on the line to you people, you reprobates. Wicked people. <laughs> okay. Uh, now he says, I, I, from the beginning I've declared before these things so that you wouldn't say mine idol is, has accomplished these things. And he said, he says, thou hast seen and heard, sixth verse of this, and will ye not declare them that I have showed thee new things from the, this time, even hidden things, and thou didst not know them of thyself. If I hadn't told you, you wouldn't have known. And they are created now, but they weren't from the beginning. They've all come to pass, in other words, but not in the beginning. Even before the day when thou heardest them not, they were declared unto thee, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew that. Oh, I, there's nothing new. I knew that. Yea, and thou heardst not, yea, thou knewest not, yea, from that time thine ear was not open, for I knew that you would deal very treacherously. You were called a transgressor from your mother's womb. Nevertheless, for my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain from thee that cut thee not off, that I cut thee not off. I have refined thee, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. And he was saying to them, in other words, your affliction is just beginning. Uh, you, before I'm through with you, you'll be polished shafts too. But meanwhile, uh, you are really reprobate. And I'm not going to give my glory to another. I am going to use you people who were valiant in the pre-existence and, uh, and thresh you and refine you till you stand up and be noble as you're capable of being. That's what he's saying. Now he said, you want to know who I am? I'm the first and I'm the last. Who's talking? Who's talking? This is Christ talking. Jehovah in the Old Testament. It's Christ. Uh, he said, I, I, I laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens. I call them and they stand up. See, if you don't understand intelligence in matter, these passages mean nothing. I speak to the intelligences and I say, and let the dry ground come up out of the waters. And in the book of Moses it says, and the gods watched until they were obeyed. See, once we understand intelligence and matters, the building blocks of the universe described in Doctrine and Covenants section 93, you know what Isaiah means when uh, he writes that the Christ says that I call upon the heavens and the earth to stand up and perform and be in their places. And they stand up together. Now all ye assemble yourselves and hear who among them hath declared these things unto them. Isaiah is talking about himself. Now, who told you all this? The Lord loved that man that came and told you all these things. Isn't that interesting? How he, he's in the third person here. The Lord loved him. Yea, and he will fulfill his word. What he said he's going to fulfill, which he had declared by them. And he will do his pleasure on Babylon. His arm shall come upon the Chaldeans as this prophet came among you and told. Meaning, I, Isaiah, I told you. Now, I've told you Babylon's going to fall. Chaldeans are going to fall. Uh, the Lord's going to let them conquer, conquer the Assyrians, and then they in turn will be conquered themselves. Also saith the Lord, I the Lord, yea, I have spoken. I have called him. Who is him? Isaiah is trying to tell them, I tell you I'm a prophet of God, and God will fulfill my words. Who was it came among you and told you these things? God loved him, and God will fulfill his words. And the... And, um, I have called him to declare, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. 
Come ye near unto me. This is Isaiah talking. I have not spoken in secret. From the beginning, from the time that it was declared unto me, in other words, have I spoken it to you, and the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. You see Isaiah telling, talking now? Now, see, you've got to read that carefully because there's Christ talking in verse 15 and there's Isaiah talking in 16. Did you see the transition? Did you follow that? And then he says, And thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Now he's back to the Savior, the Holy One of Israel. I have sent him. Isaiah says, I want to quote the Lord to you. I have sent him. The Lord thy God who teacheth thee to profit, who leadeth thee by the way thou shouldst go, hath done it. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Ah, that's great writing. That's great. Now listen. Thy seed also had been as the sand, and thine offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. And his name should have not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Uh, meaning these wicked people. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declare ye, tell this utter to the ends of the earth, say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. Now the 20th verse refers to the Jews coming back from Babylon after the Babylonians captured them. Babylon will go down. Nebuchadnezzar, who's a Chaldean and who gained control over the Babylonians, he will fall. Thus saith the Lord through the words of Isaiah. That's the way these men talked. And he said, you'll be able to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. This is what he's talking about. And you'll, th um, you'll, be th you'll thirst not, you'll be led through the de deserts, and uh, he causeth waters to flow out of the rock for them. This is the kind of a God you're worshiping. And, but he says, let me tell you, in spite of all that God does for his people, there is no peace under the wicked. There is no peace under the wicked. Isn't that a great chapter? That's Isaiah 48. All right. Now, Nephi's working up now to this 49, which is the gathering of Israel in the latter days, so that he can uh, share it with us. Yes, that's right. That's those other intelligence. See, actually what you have, you have a universe here for a body. You have billions, you have trillions and trillions of little intelligences out there, each uh, carrying around a little piece of element, all combined together, doing what God has set up for them to do on their respective levels. Those of you who are taking pre-med will stand in amazement as you watch these little characters uh, gather together. You break a, a bone why all those little cells all gather together, and of course each cell is a little world of intelligences made up. They'll reorganize themselves. They anticipate things that yet have to have have, have, have to happen. Uh, they'll reorganize themselves. It's just fabulous. And once you understand this doctrine, you'll understand why scientists are now saying we are seeing finite intelligence all through the organic processes of nature. Well, the Lord revealed it over a hundred and some odd years ago. Yes, in other words, those little intelligence, my, the, the intelligence at the tip of my finger is not allowed to tell me what it's seeing, but it is seeing things. It's now cut off from my brain. When I am quickened, every, pa every one of those little intelligences will be broadcasting in what it's seeing. This is what Brigham Young was talking about. He had seen um, bodies that had been elevated to this extent so that every intelligence in your body is radiating to your intelligence everything it's seeing and experiencing. Yes? The, where it says it? Um, in the, uh, I have it put together um, in a handout called <laughs> a working memorandum on the creation. But it's also in the appendix of the first 2,000 years. I put it there. Why is the atonement necessary? There's a whole section there on intelligences in matter. And our Heavenly Father says, that's how I get my power. When they honor me, that gives me power. That's the whole key to the atonement, which many scholars have missed. Exactly. And when the priesthood is exercised, and as our Heavenly, uh, as Je Jehovah said to Nephi the second 
whatsoever thou commandest these elements to do, I say in the presence of my angels, which means my priesthood beyond the veil, all these shall obey thy word, because I know thou won't, will not command them to do anything that would not be my will. Therefore I give this power to you. That's priesthood power, the power to create, the power to reorganize, the power to say to a hand, be leprous and it's leprous, be clean and it's clean, the dead to rise. This is power of priesthood, the power to speak to those intelligences and have them respond. Oh, that's, that's second Nephi. You're coming to that in your, in your Book of Mormon. That's up in Helaman. Uh, and we'll be coming to that very shortly. In fact, this happens several times where God says, I declare in the presence of mine angel, he, he said this to Elijah, that there will be famine until you say it's to be otherwise. There'll be no rain until you command it to be otherwise. And the king Ahab says, grab that man, make him say the right words. Elijah was gone. He's a hit and run prophet. <laughs> yes. Yes, you see, you've got a little master intelligence up there. That's you. And you did so well before the pre-existence, you were tested, that you were able to get a body that was a universe of intelligence as a matter, all organized to obey you as a spirit body. Then now you've been added upon with another universe of intelligence and element, which is obeying you pretty much. It has the seeds of death in it, so it's a little bit rebellious, you notice. But your task is to bring it under your domination. And when you do, you're born of the spirit. That's what it means. When you get in charge of your body, you're born again. Make your commitments to God and get in charge of your body. That's the new birth process. You getting in charge. Some people go around and um, I'm not going to fast. Who's in charge? The body, naturally. And he says, oh, I'm not going to. Nine o'clock class. Too sleepy. Who's in charge? You know, that lazy body. So you get it out of there and get that bot down to class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have just one more minute. Now, the reason I took this morning to take this time out, I just wanted to share Isaiah with you in his, in his power. Now, if you will start studying this way, now wait a minute, don't get restless now. When you are doing your future studying, will you see if you can circle just two or three words in a full paragraph or verse? See if that doesn't help you, because President Lee says, I want the saints to begin to commence to start giving sermons from the scriptures. You think if you had a chapter circled like that, you could stand up and say, brothers and sisters, let me tell you about the, uh, one of the most exciting sermons given by an individual who you all know, but I just want you to hear what he said would happen in our day. And he couldn't tell us, the Lord would let him tell us how it comes out, although he knew. But let, he, let, let me read to you what he said. He had a great promise for those who were righteous, who put up their two years supply, who attended the conferences and knew what the brethren wanted and stayed close to the prophet of God. It is 1 Nephi chapter 22. Now, brothers and sisters, here's what it says. Do you think you could give a good sermon that way? That's the way President Lee wants us to start giving our sermons. So in my high council assignment, I have the bishops announce any time I'm going to speak, tell the saints to bring their Book of Mormon or standard works, whatever I'm going to talk out of. All right, thank you.